Well, hi everyone. Today we're going to be discussing a message from Jesus received by James Paget on the 25th of December 1915. And I'm very fortunate to have Jesus here to discuss it with us. Uh, so I'm going to invite him to read his own message and hopefully we'll have some great discussion about it. No worries, yep. I remember this message well, actually. Yeah. So um, it, it'll be good to have a discussion about it. But I feel the title of the message is probably not the correct title. Um, it says that as a title, Jesus says he is not God but an elder brother. Sin has no existence except as it is created by mankind and man must pay the penalties. Now, I probably would have called this uh, message truth, error, sin and humility. <laughs> or something along those kind of lines. Because that's the real essence of what's written? Cer yeah. Certainly, yeah, certainly. And um, I feel it's a very important principle, some very important principles are contained in this message that I believe that most people have little understanding of, even, if, even people who have been listening to Divine Truth for many years. Yeah. And so I feel it's a very important message to gain a basic understanding of. <coughs> I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing your, your mm. thoughts and feelings about So what do you want me to do? Yeah, so if you'd be happy just to <laughs> start reading and just pause where you feel it's a good place. That we need to discuss some things. Yeah, okay. say a few more things about it. <coughs> no worries. I am here, Jesus. I come tonight because I see that you are lonesome and feel the need of companionship. And I come to you as a brother and a friend to cheer you and make you feel that though you have no mortal friend with you, Yet you have a friend in the spirit world who is closer than a mortal brother and who loves you with a deep and abiding love. I'd probably like to just comment about that. It's December the 25th, obviously. obviously, yeah. and, um, and I've spent a lot of my life in this life alone on December the 25th, so I know the feelings as well that James had. And I was aware of the feelings he had when he was alone. On, during the holiday period, he was often alone yeah. after Helen's death. And his children were off having their Christmases with other people and so forth. And uh, he often felt quite lonely. And one of the reasons why we could easily channel to him most nights was because he felt quite lonely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he wanted somebody to talk to. And obviously when we came and talked to him, he would listen to, to whatever we had to say. But also I just wanted to state my love for the man. Um, he... He was unique in a lot of ways, I feel, James Paget, and um, most people, I feel, who read the Paget messages do not understand uh, that his unique condition um, allowed for the transmission of really, really clear messages of truth that we, prior, prior to this time, could not channel to anybody on earth. We never found anybody up until this time with a willingness and openness to channeling the kind of information that we actually channeled to him. And as a result of that, I felt a quite a deep love for him and spent a lot of time with him in the spirit, in the spirit world. And, and I feel that, well, even now, I think it's even stated, it is stated in the pageant messages themselves that even the people close to me in the celestial realms could not understand why I loved him so much and could not understand why I spent so much time with him. Yeah, I have this running joke with you, don't I, about the fact that, um, you know, as I reread the messages, there's all these messages. Um, I often hear people comment about the fact that Paget had so many doubts and he needed so much reassurance. But really, if you examine the early part of the messages where you and others first started coming to him, a lot of people that he knew came to him and said, I don't know. I don't know why he's talking to you. You're not that special. Like, we, and you don't even have that much You're not divine spiritual love. At all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, I often feel for, for him. him that <laughs> oh, okay. Getting I'm... all these doses of truth without having the uh, the ability emotionally really to cope with them at the time. Yeah. Mm. And also the point that you mentioned about just the fondness that we both have for him. Mm. Um, I feel he's an amazing case study, if you like. You can read the individual messages and they contain so much truth, but I'm often finding myself now as a medium, again, I'm examining the qualities of Paget as a medium mm. uh, all, that run all through the messages. Mm. And there's a lot, you know, he has a deep humility. Mm. He also 
the incredible service that he does to spirits. And his love for spirits in darkness it, it was quite was, was much more extreme than I've met since on Earth. Um, even amongst the people who are mediums today, they don't have as much that we know, yeah. don't have as much love for spirit in darkness that Paget had and the ability to give the time to them that he wanted to give to them. Yeah, mm. that's what I feel. He didn't mm. have any earthly reward for this service that he was doing. No. And often even Helen and others were saying to him, look, don't talk to those people <laughs> who aren't a member of our band. You know, we need you in a good yeah. condition. Yeah. But he had a really strong feeling that, no, I want to help these people. And yeah. I find that it's a really beautiful part of his nature. Yeah, it is. And if you, if even Helen, who's sometimes awarding him against it, if we examine her life in the spirit world, she's very much dedicated to helping. This helping as Certainly. well. Certainly, so and you can see the. Soul. And also, she said to him, "I quite often, she quite often marvelled about the level of assistance he could give to dark spirits." Um, assistance that we as celestial spirits couldn't easily give for lots of different reasons. Yeah. 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 Mm. Anyway, so today has been one in which the people of your land have celebrated what they suppose is my birthday and have also worshipped me as one of the triune Godhead, as they believe. But as I have told you before, such worship is all wrong and is very distasteful to me and only makes me the more anxious and determined that this great falsehood shall be exposed and not believed in any longer. There is only one God, and that is the Father, and he alone must be worshipped, for he alone can save mortals from the result of their sins and from the consequences of the great fall of the first parents. I do not want men to look upon me as anything more than an older brother who is filled with the divine love of the Father and very close to him in the qualities of love and faith. So... Uh, you know, this is a problem that I face pretty much every Christmas time, um, the amount of worship that is focused towards myself. And obviously, um, I've always had some distaste for it, and I still have some distaste for it. Um, and I was coming to him in a lot of ways because he was one of the few people on earth at, the, at that moment who wasn't involved in this distasteful uh, action towards myself. So, yeah. How do you feel um, about all this? You have the unique position that, mo like many, many people, believe that you're God. Um, and, and here you are coming, you know, 100 years ago to Paget and saying, tr trying to spread the truth that you're not. Mm. And it wasn't a very well known truth at that time and still isn't really. No. Do you no. still have feelings about that as you read that? Yeah, I've had to work my way through quite a lot of feelings about those kind of issues. Now now my feelings are, um, I don't have as much sort of emotional feelings about it now as I used to have, but uh, I still feel that the whole process of Christmas, I don't feel any attraction to it at all at this point. And when people around us are involved in Christmas, uh, most of the time they don't understand why I don't seem to have any attraction to it. And I've never had any attraction to it my entire life, both Christmas and Easter. Uh, obviously, Easter has a bit of a different feeling for me than Christmas because it was uh, a time of a lot of trauma for yourself and and the rest of the disciples my, at the time of my death. And so I do have more feelings associated perhaps with Easter. With Christmas, it wasn't the time of my birth in the first century. And as a date, there was no import to it aside from the fact that uh, Con Constantine selected the date based on the worship of the sun god mm. uh, uh, because it was the shortest day of the Northern Hemisphere year. And that's the only reason why that particular date was ever chosen. And so it was even an amalgamation of pagan belief systems that caused that day to be chosen as the date of my birth. And what people do at my birth is, is way out of harmony with all the principles of, of God's truth. And so I've always felt... In what felt way? What do you... Well, firstly, worshipping a man is a, is a, you know, completely out of harmony with any of divine truth. Like every time we worship a man, we are going to be disappointed. <laughs> Even if that man is Jesus, we're going to still be disappointed because he's just a man and, and he's not God. He can't do what God can do. He can't give divine love. As I explained in this message, yeah. he, I can't do all of the things that people expect or think that I can do. 
And as a result, they, uh, when they actually find out the truth about all those kind of things, they would probably d be disappointed. Yeah. Now, a lot of them direct that as disappointment towards myself, but that's, you know, that's not very fair considering I'm just a man. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, if they're disappointed, they need to be disappointed with their own belief systems that have ca caused and encouraged such falsehood. So th there's lots of different reasons why I feel that it, that is a very false teaching. And, you know... If people want to have a celebration, then it would be great if the celebration was about something meaningful. In this case, my birth, although um, perhaps an important time in the sense of the arrival of the, or, or the potential, because at this point, the time of my birth, there was only the potential of the arrival of divine truth on the planet because I had to go through a process. I had to embrace a process that God wanted me to embrace, but which, and for which we had been created, but um, it had to be engaged through my will. I had to decide that I wanted it as well. And so it wasn't a given that after my birth um, I would engage those particular processes. I could have exercised my will in a completely different direction. Of course, if that had happened, then somebody else would have been provided by God <laughs> to exercise their will in the other direction. Yeah, I suppose I see that it's very special that God decided to offer this gift again and your birth sort of marks the... I was born later than you and yeah. also you were born with some slightly... Um, different circumstances, so there was there was some less there was less error or less impediments to error. Can we say? Yeah, God provided the opportunity for divine love to come to the planet through, and also to the spirit world through the advent of our, our of our well, really of our birth, but but before then our conception, really. Yeah. But uh, but it did have to we had to engage our will to, to, for it to occur. And I feel that most people don't even understand that. They sort of feel it was some kind of given. Yes. And, and, you know, I feel there's quite a lot of issues in, in this process of belief, the belief systems of the Christian belief systems that, that reduce all of that choice out of the equation and almost make it that I am some kind of puppet of God or God himself. Yeah. Either one is just as false as the other. Um, because and it reduces your identity as a man and your, your will, your, yeah, your, the exercise. And the fact the that I'm allowed to choose whatever yeah. I wish to choose in, and I have the same constraints upon, placed upon me as every other being who is ever other human who, soul that has ever incarnated has placed upon them. Yeah. So, you know, the... The, the idea or concept that I don't have the same constraints or I'm not under the same laws or I don't have the same principle. And there's even people who believe that I don't have a soulmate and all those kind of things. Uh, they're all false and they cause a lot of false beliefs as a consequence. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But if I continue, right. yes. um, I say I am a spirit who is possessed of a knowledge of the attributes of the Father that no other spirit is. And yet I am only one of his children as you and the rest of mankind are. And for my own brothers to worship me as God makes me very unhappy, seeing that they can have such little knowledge of the truths of the Father. Tomorrow this worship and praise will be continued, and I must look upon it with all the distaste that I have and realise that I'm not able to set men aright in their beliefs and worship. Oh, I tell you, the harvest is ripe and the labourers are few. But very soon I hope this truth of the oneness of God and the brotherhood of myself with all humanity may be revealed to mankind through the messages that you may receive and transmit to men. It's a, that, that verse that I quote, quoted there, um, that the harvest is great and the work is a few, is a verse I've quoted to you quite frequently yes. in this life. <laughs> <laughs> so can you explain for us what, what that means, that analogy? Well, what I see in humanity, particularly at the moment, is this huge soul-based longing for truth to be distributed to the world. And there are lots of people on this planet, far more people on this planet than most people realise, that have an inbuilt, heartfelt longing for more truth. Mm -hmm. And yet there are very few people who actually hear the truth, who want to share it, or who actually practise it themselves. So the harvest is great. In other words, the potential for a harvest is great. 
But the actual people who are sharing the truth with others is very, very few. And, and that is a constant problem yeah. that we have observed on the earth for 2000 years, that there is this longing in mankind for more truth. But at the same time, everyone who does find the truth doesn't have the courage and desire and passion to share it with others, to let their light shine towards others. And I feel this is a main problem. It, it is to do with the fear of truth and the consequences which we go in, which I go into in this message, which causes people to, to um, honour their own longing of truth at some point, but to not wish to share it. Fear is the only thing that guides uh, their desire to stop sharing it yeah. or the desire to practise truth in their day-to-day -day lives. We still see many people clo very close to us who are still denying the power of truth in their own lives constantly. Yeah. And as a result of that, they can't become a worker in the harvest. They can only be part of the harvest that's yet to be yeah. uh, gleaned, if you like. Yeah. They, they are not workers in the harvest yet. To, to become a worker in the harvest, you need to practice the principles of divine truth in your day-to-day -day life. That's how you become a worker of the harvest. And, and that's why I said, look, the harvest is great, but the workers are very few. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's a huge collective sort of need and desire for more truth and more growth. Yeah. And yet there's very few people who are willing, even if they have some knowledge of the truth, willing to step into that and live it, yeah. trust it, have faith in it. There's so much fear and the fear, whenever I see fear now, I see fear as a main, the main problem on the planet. Even amongst the people who have heard divine truth, fear is still the main problem on the planet. Everyone is so afraid of what other people will think of them, what, you know, what other people will do when they hear the truth and all these kind of things. And, and so, you know, fear is, the, is, if you like, one of the primary enemies of mankind yeah. um, because it, it prevents so much from happening and it prevents the harvest from happening actually as well. Yeah. So whenever I see people in fear, while you know, I do have some compassion for the reasons why their fear are created, I, I do not have any honour for the fact that they honour their fear over, over acting in harmony with God's laws. And, because the, and this is a major problem that we face on the planet. And it's the major reason why divine truth is, it has a very slow uptake on the earth is, is primarily because the people who hear divine truth are still in large amounts of fear. And I've had so many discussions with people, even in this life, about fear, but it feels to me like everyone still wants to justify their fears to themselves and to others. And, and they get angry with me when I don't justify their fears. But if they could see that fear is their primary enemy and that if they live in fear, it, it causes all sorts of damage. And it also causes this damage to the harvest, the, the ability for other people to be attracted to divine truth people will be attracted to people who are fearless. Uh, they will. But, but if we don't learn to become fearless in our own personal life, then in the end, we're not practicing the principles of divine truth. And also we, we can't be involved in the harvest, no matter how much we think we can. Yeah. How much we'd like to be. Yeah. yeah. So the one great truth that is the foundation of men's salvation is the new birth and the fact that the divine love of the Father is waiting for every man to let it enter his soul and make him at one with the Father. I am with you very often and I'm trying to impress you with the, the great necessity of having these truths revealed. As men's souls are longing for the truth and their intellects are dissatisfied with the present teachings of theology and the sayings of the Bible in many places. While this is to be deplored, yet the time will come when the light that I came, that I came into the world to disclose will shine for every man who may come within the reach of my teachings. So, so here I'm saying that basic point, like the point that I was just raising earlier, this concept that you know, there, there's, there's a longing, there's a deep longing in men and women to hear more truth but at the same time, a complete lack of courage when they receive it. Yeah. And, uh, and this is the main problem. To let your light shine, it's going to require courage. It's going to require integrity to God's laws. It's going to require integrity to love. 
a desire to love no matter what the consequences are, even if the consequences seem, you know, burdensome or harmful to yourself. And, uh, and I'm afraid that at this point in time, very few people have that kind of integrity. Yeah. yeah. Last night I was reading, as you read an article, which advocated the eliminating from the Christian teachings of a large part of the New and nearly the whole of the Old Testament and the formulating of a faith based entirely on my sayings and the writings of some of the Bible writers. Such a plan is one that should be investigated by the thinking Christians of the present day and in a modified way adopted. The only difficulty in carrying out this plan effectively and having it produce the results desired is that the Bible does not contain many sayings of mine disclosing the truth and does contain many sayings attributed to me, which I never said. And then I go into discussing some of those sayings. So, so this is a, what I see as a big problem is that, and, and it's been such a big problem ever since I left the planet in the first century. This problem of attributing to me things I never said, thinking that you understand my words when you don't obviously understand them. Your life is a, is a reflection of the fact that you don't understand them. And, and then also ignoring many of the things that I actually did say because you don't understand them. <laughs> and, uh, and I feel that, you know, this is a big problem with the Bible, but it's also a big problem with people who listen to the pageant messages and, and other people who in the modern times, because they still do the same exact same thing. They still do the same thing, ignoring things that I actually did say, and then postulating about things that I never said. Yeah. And they try to incorporate a heap of other things into it that is not being said. And I feel this is very dangerous to divine truth, but it's also very dangerous to their own soul progression because what they're doing is they're grabbing hold of things that their addictive desires state that they want to hold on to, while at the same time rejecting things that their, that their fear determines they should reject, when the reality is if you're completely open to God and completely open to truth and completely open to love, you would have a far more logical way of analysing all the information that comes to you. So, so really, you we were basically saying there's a limitation in the root and word. You have to be open to God and open. And I'm reminded of something in Through the Mist where I think it's Kushner says to Fred that the difficulty is that people miss the spirit of the word and focus on the word. Mm -hmm. And if we're open to God from what you're saying, mm -hmm. then we can receive the spirit. Like we receive, we understand that love should guide yeah. our, our spiritual progression. And there are certain words that might open us or inspire us to discover more truth about things. But if we're, if we're doing it from a very intellectual basis, we're going to miss, miss the point. Yeah, I, I believe that the biggest problem, uh, one of the biggest problems is, well, you know, if we could, if I could just list perhaps the two biggest problems that I see. The first biggest problem is the lack of desire and understanding about God, mm -hmm. the lack of desire for and the desire to understand God's attributes and qualities and to enter a relationship with God. That is the biggest issue that I see within the humankind. The second biggest issue that I see within humankind is this issue of not understanding how the soul operates, not understanding you know, what goes on inside of the soul and how it absorbs truth and why error continues to dictate most of a person's experience most people on the planet still do not understand how the soul works yeah. and they don't understand why it works the way it works and how God's created it. So, so one of the things we're going to do in the next few months is, for, is raise a whole heap of FAQ questions, of frequently asked questions about, firstly, about God, God's attribute and nature, God's qualities and the origin of life and the origin of God's laws. And then the second thing that I also want to do concurrently is helping people understand how their own soul operates in terms of how it absorbs truth and how, how error is released from the soul. Because without understanding those two basic things, you cannot have a relationship with God. And, and you also probably will not demo demonstrate hardly any desire. You will demonstrate hardly any desire for God. Yeah. And it's, you know, most people, it, I, I feel it still hasn't settled with most people who hear the divine truth that we're calling it divine truth because it's God's truth, mm -hmm. that it's absolute truth. And we call it divine love because it's God's love, you know, and, and what love, the love that God can give to us. And, 
this, of course, is going to require a relationship with God. It's not uh, like a lot of people want to grow and they want to change and they want their life to change and they want their life to be easier, but they want to do it all without God still. Yeah. Uh, and if they want to do it without God, that's their choice, but don't come to the divine love path or to the divine truth thinking you're going to be able to do it without God yeah. because the reality is you're not going to be able to do any of it without God. And you're going to have to develop a relationship with God at some point yeah. if you want to follow the divine truth because it is God's truth. It's a relationship with God that determines the truth yeah. of, of the absolute universe and determines our ability to absorb it. So without this relationship, it's impossible to understand anything that I'm really speaking of. <laughs> and, and I just feel like for the majority of people, there's still this high concentration of energy and effort on improving their own life and improving their own lifestyle if they have a concentration and effort in any direction. Yeah. But there is very little time spent with their relationship with God, developing a relationship with God and understanding and coming to feel God. Uh, is a very important part of that relationship. Yeah, I see that as well. And that's one of the reasons why a couple of the earlier messages that we've discussed really outlined people right at the beginning of the journey and Paget taking them through this experiment. Mm. And I've been focusing on the blog about this idea of just simply engaging with God every day. Yeah. And that is the starting point of everything that comes afterwards, isn't it? Yep. And yep. unless we're willing to do that, it we can't really deepen our spiritual growth or no. our relationship with God or even our relationship with others. It's no, because as we've said in the Paget messages, but also as we've said plenty of times now, natural love is not a binding force. Yeah. A lot of people believe they have divine love when they've actually just got natural love. Yeah. And that's why as soon as a pressure time comes away, they throw out their natural love and go back to their old behaviour. Yeah. And natural love is like this building a foundation on sand. And that's why I gave the illustration in the Bible about building this, the house on rock or on stone or on sand. And, you know, most people still, even though they've heard the divine truth, are still building their, soul, their soul's house mm. on sand yeah. in that they're still focusing on the development of the natural love, not understanding that this natural love does not have the power or ability to have any consistency in the long run. You know, as soon as the natural love, uh, it, can, it can web it can flow ebb. and yes, ebb. Yeah. and ebb, yeah. you know, depending on the different emotional things that inside of us that are triggered. Divine love is not like that. No. Once we receive divine love into our soul and embrace it with our soul, with, with truth, it's impossible to be inconsistent on, on issues. And it fortifies our natural love, doesn't it? it of course. It purifies yeah. it. It makes it a more substantial substance yeah. because we're guided by God's laws in the application of that love. and. Yeah. God's love is removed from us base injuries inside of us that were really tainting that ability to love other people. Exactly. But, but also divine love is far more power than natural love because yeah. pa the power of natural love comes from the integrity of the individual. The power of God's love comes from God's integrity, which that is, which is infinite. That statement is amazing. So, you know, the power of the individual, the integrity of the individual is limited and severely limited if we uh, have yet to discover love at all. And, and so, of course, there's not going to be any integrity to the principles of truth in a person who's just driven by natural love. But once a person receives divine love, there is integrity to the principles of truth. They, they will honour the principles of truth without any ability to be modified or, or changed. And as a result of that, they will be firm and fixed in the principles of truth, as I go on to outline in this discussion. Well, let's go on. Mm. Hey? Yeah. I said, take that saying over which a controversy is now being had and which is referred to in another article contained in the book mentioned. That is that I said, I came not to bring peace into the world, but rather a sword. Now, just to give a bit of background there, he was reading a book and he was only up to a certain part of the book, but I'd read the whole book, of course, <laughs> over his shoulder, if you like. And so um, I was mentioning different parts of the book in, that he had yet to read here. And then I said, now, while it appears in Matthew's gospel is coming from me, I never said it, nor used any expression that would convey the meaning that some of the commentators are endeavouring to place upon the words. I never taught war upon a man's neighbour and never at any time was such a thought a part of my teachings to the disciples or to any others. No, militarism is all wrong and against the precepts of truth 
and it should not for a moment be believed by any Christian or by anyone else that such action was ever advocated by me. Now, this is where I was referring to the scripture. Um, I meant to note exactly where it is in Matthew. Do you know off the top of your head? Not off the top of my head now. Um, but, it's, but it's the scripture that says, I came to produce a fourth sword, uh, not, not to produce peace, which, which is something I never actually said. Yeah. And it also ref- is a similar reference in the book of Mark and Luke about um, I came to cause divisions among families and, and so forth which I actually never said. I, I did say that the truth would potentially cause divisions among families mm-hmm. uh, for the reasons I go on to explain in this yeah. message, but I never actually said those words. And, and unfortunately, many people have used those words, even Christians have used those words as an excuse to go to war. Mm. And uh, this, is, this is the problem with taking words out of context is they're eventually used to excuse unloving behaviour, which is so evil in its nature to, to actually take words and then use these words as an excuse to, to, to engage in evil behaviour, which eventually damages your own soul, but also the soul of others. And this is why one of the reasons why I was so firm about this issue with Paget. Yeah. Um, so what I wanted to do then with Paget is show him this relationship between truth and error. And, and I still feel that the majority of people on the planet has no idea about this relationship and why this relationship exists. Yeah, and this is really the, um, the, the basis of this message. There's, there's some very important things that you're just about to outline, aren't you? Certainly, so, yeah. So let's, let's start with yeah. them. While the truth will cause a division, as I know, among men as to what the truth is, and may even separate and cause bitter thoughts and even hatred to arise in the souls of men towards their fellow men, and even brother may come to dislike brother, Yet the accomplishing of such results was not the object of my coming to earth and teaching the truths, but rather they are the results of the unavoidable conflict between truth and error. Truth cannot compromise even for the sake of peace, and error will not submit or acknowledge its untruth so long as it can get any mortal to believe in and advocate it. So here what I'm pointing out is this basic fundamental Truth about truth. Yes. <laughs> and that is that truth cannot compromise. Once you know what the truth is, you cannot compromise even for the sake of peace. Yeah. Even for the sake of peace. It doesn't mean, as I go on to explain, that you would go to war for it. You will just be solid in not compromising. That's all you will do. You, you, will t- you have some solidity inside of yourself some, and you will not compromise the truth no matter how much pressure is brought against you. Now, error will not acknowledge the untruth so long as any person on the planet wants to believe the error. Now, most people on the planet want to believe in some error. That's why we have pain and suffering because yes. we want to believe in the error. Now, this is the problem that we face as humankind. We individually want to believe in error and we have all sorts of justifications for doing so, most of which are based around our addictions and our fears, right? The error within us. Yes. We want to hold on to this error and we want to make sure that everyone else around us also believes the same error. And that's also something that's wrong with error. Error tries to perpetrate itself without respect for another's free will. So what it tries to do is push itself onto other people. It browbeats and eventually, in many cases, even kills people just because they don't agree with it. And this, this is what I like about this message because it's almost as if we're discussing truth and error as entities or a substance. And it is like that in our soul, isn't it? Well, if you think of the entity of truth, that does exist not as an entity, as a living being, but, but if you think about God and God's divine truth or God's absolute truth, that is an energy of God. That is actually, uh, and the Holy Spirit is one of the main emanations of that energy because it is a spirit of truth. So the, the, the divine truth is an actual energy that comes from God. Mm-hmm. So while it's not an entity in itself, we can think of it as, a, as, a, as something that we need to hold on to for our very future existence in order to be happy, 
Right, so so it is such an important aspect of our development, and it has qualities to it. And it has one qualities. of these is it never compromises. That's one. I've gone through qualities on the internet site, of you know there are literally hundreds of other qualities of truth. Yeah. I've listed fifteen or sixteen qualities of divine truth on our site, yeah. but uh, this is one of them. Yeah. Uh, this is one of the primary ones of them, actually. But then we're sort of viewing error. Error has its its qualities and attributes. Or and its error is the creation of mankind, and it is only the creation of mankind. No other being in the universe has the ability at the soul level to express free will. So it's only mankind that can create error. God does not create it. God's laws don't create it. It's only the, the gift that mankind's been given of free will that allows for the creation of error. And error is man's creation, only mankind's creation. And by man, I mean men and women's creation. Yeah. Um, humankind. Humankind's yeah. creation. And error in itself, while a human wants to hold onto it, it will exist but it can be released and no longer exist in God's universe, as I go on to point out. Yeah. And these are come some of the things I'd like to, to mention. But, it, but this, this thing here that error in itself will not submit or acknowledge its untruth so long as it can get any mortal to believe in it and advocate. That is, that is massive in terms of its implications for the way the w world runs right now. It of is, course. That's a, that, the way the world runs right now is a symptom of that very statement, isn't it? Yes, but here I did not, I did not have the ability to explain to him why error had that attribute, if you like, the attribute of trying to get other people to believe it, which is the attribute I was trying to explain to Patrick because he didn't understand that so well. Yeah. But what I was trying to explain to him is that error will try to force itself upon, as I state later, mm -hmm. force itself upon somebody who's in truth. It, error, this is one of the attributes of error, is that it, it, instead of just disclosing itself, it forces itself. Yes which is very, very different to truth. Truth just discloses itself and remains in that non-compromising state. Error is willing to compromise on all sorts of fronts, but also it, 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 it pushes itself or attacks itself or attaches itself to others through this process of attempting to change the other. And that's, that's out of harmony with free will, obviously. Yeah. Yep. And if we give maybe a concrete example of that, say in our soul, there's a lot of truth expressed from you, and I still have a lot of error, fear. Yep. So let's use the example of fear. Mm -hmm. And often um, we have this dynamic in our relationship that you've been aware of for a long time and I'm becoming very aware of, when there's a fear in me and there is, I can sense now this feeling of a desire for you to join me in my fear or a desire for you to agree with my fear yeah and you you very much display the quality of truth where you say i can't compromise mm. i can't compromise I, I, can't, can't, I can't agree i, I don't can't come to your party i'm not going to try and and i don't expect you to come to mine no you but, respect but i'm will. just saying no i can't go there yeah. with you yeah. and and this is the demand that fear has upon others it demands that the person who is potentially in more truth comes along with the fear. Yes. And this is a, and, and that's what error does. Error does exactly that. Error demands other people agree with it. Truth does not demand anybody agrees. It just states itself and leaves itself in a non-compromising state. And this is where last time we got together, we talked about the, the law of free will and how e easy it is to compromise it uh, when we're in fear. Mm. And this is what I've noticed as well, because I'm in fear, but I'm becoming more sensitive to everything around me. I, I'm in the company of people in error and I feel the pull upon my will. And because I, you know, mm. I'm not honoring this law of free will, Oh, now I've joined error. Hang on. <laughs> exactly. And that's that's the um, that's why sometimes it feels heavy to be around certain people, or you know, because there's a pull on our will through error. Yeah. Whereas, but, but also we need to understand God. too that that this is why there is no labourers for the harvest. Mm -hmm. To be a labourer for the harvest, we need to get into the state where we honour the truth in an uncompromising stance, and we don't respond to the pool of error in our life. Exactly. Mm. For, for me, with this issue of the will and the error and the truth, it, that is my opportunity to honour the law now of exactly. free will 
to challenge the error. And honour the truth, and honour love, and honour all, all these things. All these, all these beautiful principles, yeah. principles of, that are related to God. Yeah. If I choose that in that situation, the error still pulls on me, but I grow. The, and, and you'll feel some emotion. You, you'll then definitely. You'll work through why the error can pull on you. Yes. But if you just accede to it, if you just agree and go along, then all you're doing is, is, is you're causing as much problem as the person in error is causing in that moment. Well, it's my error that's, that's leading to well, the compromise. Well, it's it? not the error that leads to the compromise. It, it's the lack of integrity and lack of courage that leads to the compromise. Yeah. And we need to see that we, we, if, if, we, if we're constantly compromising truth, it's not because of the error that exists in us that we compromise truth. Yeah, sure. It's because of the lack of courage and integrity that have. We, we're not developing two primary qualities in our day-to-day -day life that if we're ever going to be a, a worker in the harvest, mm -hmm. we need to develop. Yeah. And if we're ever going to let our light shine to other men, we need to develop. And, so I, and, and also I feel if we're ever going to be personally happy, we need to develop. Because every time you're dragged into the error, through the, you know, the pushiness and demands of the error, you then are compromising truth. Every time you compromise truth, you compromise law. Every time you compromise law, you create pain and suffering, not only for yourself, but also for others. Yeah. And so the pain and suffering that we're living in is all the result of us still acceding, to, still agreeing with, still going along with, still um, allowing ourselves to fall into this pattern of honouring the error over truth. Yeah, mm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Please continue.